Let's make the unjust just. Change. Joining, for joining us um, today. Um, for those who've just joined, I'm asking everyone to keep their cameras on. The reason being is that um, this is meant to be a community event. We are part of a larger community. And so therefore we should be able to see our community. We can feel part of that community. And so please scroll through, see everybody that's here today so that you can feel part of something larger because we are something larger than ourselves even if it is online. Um, so first of all I'd like to welcome everyone in joining me in marking the second anniversary of the murder of George Floyd and the launch of the Black Equity Organization, the new national um, civil rights organization that will tackle structural racism in the UK. Let me briefly explain what we're going to be doing over the next 90 minutes. We'll start with an interview with Britain's, with one of Britain's leading historians, David Olasoga, followed by an interview with um, Steve um, Schlesser, um, the lead prosecutor against the police officer who murdered George Floyd. And that will then be followed at 8.01, um, uh, nine minutes and 29 seconds of silence, um, the time it took to murder George Floyd. The silence will then be followed by an interview with Dame Vivian Hunt, the chair of the um, BEO, the Black Equity Organization. The, as I said, the new civil rights organization that was officially launched yesterday. And we'll then have reaction with some special guests who are also um, attending the event. And so without further ado, let me introduce a brother who really needs no introduction at all, um, David Elisoga. David Elisoga, but I will introduce you though, David, um, David Osoga OBE is a BAFTA winning filmmaker, broadcaster and historian. If I could spend the next 90 minutes lifting all your achievements and all the awards, but most importantly, um, he has become the, the voice of a people beautifully articulating our pain, the racism we face and putting it in a historical context that both increases our understanding of the challenges we face, but also how to overcome them. Um, David, welcome. Marcus, thank you. Now, this might sound like a very basic question, but why are you here today? Why do you think that us in Britain should be here talking about the murder of a black man in the US? I think what happened two years ago today was exactly that, but it was so much bigger an event than anyone would have presumed this time two years ago. I have to admit, my, my reaction when I heard the news, my reaction when I saw, and it was impossible, you might remember, to avoid seeing parts of the, the nine minutes, um, was to, uh, that I couldn't cope with this. Um, I wanted to sit this one out. I thought I couldn't do this again. Um, when I, often when I'm giving talks, I talk about self-preservation, about fighting when you can fight, looking after yourself. When you can't, I talk about the levels of mental ill health that we all know about in the Black community. And I, my instinct was, not again, I can't do this one. And that really quickly became an unviable position because what happened was not what normally happens. The normal script was not followed. And if you remember the first news reports, it was the normal script. There was, the officers weren't, were taken in, but they weren't charged. There was the normal, very familiar uh, excuses, justifications were put forward. The positioning was taking place for exactly what's happened time and time again. There was every reason to think this would end up in a court case in 18 months time with an acquittal. Um, and there was no reason to think that this would be anything other than an event that would be over forgotten in a few weeks. But for some reason, and I think we should probably get on to talk about this, but I don't think anyone fully understands there was some sort of catalytic event. Um, I would be here to remember the murder of any, any black person who's a victim of police violence. But I think we're all here, and um, the Black Equality Organization is here because that event changed us and changed the world in ways that nobody could predict this time two years ago. The other thing, the other very familiar script 
that happened in the days after the murder of George Floyd, which I think anyone who's familiar with the British media um, and interested in issues around race and equality and justice is incredibly versed in, is the ways in which the British media dismisses um, events in America and says that they have nothing to do with Britain. And that's, that's very familiar script. This is an American problem. This is not relevant to Britain. Why are you taking these American issues? And that, for reasons, again, that I don't think anyone properly understands, didn't, didn't work. Uh, it just didn't achieve the function it normally achieves. So what we had was an event that just did not go to script. The silencing and the, the minimalization um, of Black people uh, in their moment of anger and upset and outrage uh, didn't work this time. Um, so we're here because that event changed the world, uh, as I say, in ways that I wouldn't have dreamed of. I mean, we, you know, two, two years ago, we were waking up tomorrow to those images. I didn't expect any significant change. As I said, what I expected was that the normal script would be followed. And I just thought I couldn't cope watching the normal script be followed. So we're here because the world changed. Okay, so this might be a... Um... Strange question to ask a historian, especially if you're saying that the world has changed and we didn't follow the usual script. Um, what what next? Do you think things are, um, you know, because obviously I saw you give some interviews with regards to the BEO, the Black Equity Organization. What should we be doing next? Well, I think we need to, to recognize, and there's no complacency in recognizing this, is that the past two years have given us the strength to make lots of changes. Lots of organizations have looked at themselves in new ways with a new level of introspection, a new level of honesty. Uh, take the example of publishing, one of the industries that I work in. The reaction in publishing was the great, the major publishing houses have embarked upon more serious commitment to looking at who gets to tell stories, which books get published, which books don't get published, um, who decides which books get published, who are the gatekeepers and who are the selectors of stories. And Black writers themselves formed a union, formed the Guild of Black Writers, a, a, a self-help, um, I mean, very much a classical union um, that has amplified the voices and helped um, build the careers of early, uh, early career writers. Um, again, that, that was that was not predictable. It was not predicted. It is a fact of the fact that the world has changed. The fact that the BEO, the BEO came out of that sense of we need to do something that is going to be different this time. And I think building organizations, trying to take that sense of anger and outrage and pain that we felt two years ago, and actually to, to solidify it into something real, into changes, into organizations, into practices, into commitments, uh, into commitments that are personal to ourselves to not stand for certain things. I think all of those things have, have come out of the past two years, but we have to say what's also come out of the past two years is a extremely ugly um, backlash against, um, uh, against this, the anti-racist movement an extremely um, cynical weaponization of anti-racism and the and the intergenerational dismissal of young people in particular and their attitudes towards this. Um, and I, I often think that if I, when I go and go and talk to a company that's taking DNI and equity seriously, um, I come away feeling positive. But then I'm silly enough to turn on the news uh, or open a newspaper and I see the culture war posturing, I'm brought back down. And it's almost as if being in Britain at the moment is like being in a party where there's two stereos playing in two different rooms and one's playing the greatest hits of the culture wars and the other's playing a more hopeful tune uh, and I think both both are real uh, and both are emanating and you know, rever reverberating across the nation um, but both things are happening so what next is to is to make real make tangible and solidify our sense of outrage and anger. And I'm you know, very pleased to be part of an organization that is one of those moments of solidification. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more with regards to organization, you know, so um, uh, we set up the Selene Henry Center um, for Media Diversity just before George Floyd, but the idea of organization building, obviously the BEO, um, the Black Writers Guild, I went to one of their meetings uh, I think it was the weekend just gone, 
you, you can see the importance of organization. Um, you've talked about there being a generational shift about that. Um, uh, you've talked to me previously about how younger generations or how we're almost viewing the struggle against racism on a on a different level on a you know can you possibly explain explain that uh, yeah absolutely i mean uh, there's I, I would argue that what we're going through is not a political event it's a generational change the caveat with that is it is viewing groups of people through generations is an imprecise science and what 11 days after 10 african americans were murdered by a teenager in a supermarket in buffalo um, the dangers of viewing people as being their identities and their behaviors shaped by their, by their generation that must be more obvious than ever. So it, there's a there's a limit to how much you can view people um, as discrete groups of generations. But at the same time, there is absolutely clear attitudinal differences uh, in this country and other countries when it comes to these issues and these priorities. Um, when it comes to generations, if you look at the attitudinal surveys, both before and after the murder of George Floyd, attitudes, uh, opposition to racism, anti-racism stance is on the verge of becoming ubiquitous the younger the younger you, you go down uh, the, age, the age pyramid. I, and some ways I think the, um, one of the best places to see this is to contrast um, two institutions. One is our 650 MPs and the other is our 26 members of the England football team. Um, the England football team is England in its 20s. The average age of an MP is 52. The average age of a football player in the England team is 26. And you look at the 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 attitudes, the priorities, the commitment to anti-racism in that remarkable team. 13 of them dual national. Not all, not all of them. Uh, uh, um, uh, you know, some of them Irish, dual nationalities in all sorts of different ways. A, a backstory that absolutely reflects the imperial story. You contrast their voice to what you hear from Parliament, and I think you, what you see is that generational difference. There's, you know, one group is half the age of the other, uh, and look at their positions on these issues. So I think there's absolutely clear cut um, generational difference on this. And I see it. I see it in people I, I teach up in Manchester. Um, their priorities are absolutely uh, distinct and uh, committed to anti-racism. But also, I think, you know, as, as an historian, you have to often step back and think, what is, the, what, is the, what is unique about this moment? And I think it's very easy to miss what's unique about the past two years. For the first time ever, there have been thousands of marches involving millions of people against racism, and the vast majority of people on those marches have been white people. That's never happened before. There was huge white support for um, the civil rights movement in America in the 60s. There was some white support for the, the struggles and the abuses of the black community in Britain in the 1980s. But you look at the photographs, look at the film. It's mainly black people fighting for black equality. Then look at the photographs in the films of the summer of 2020. It's, it's young white people. So as much as it's can be a trap to think of people purely as having an identity that equates to their generation. This is unique, and that's you know that's something we really need to reflect upon. I, I was a, a, a witness at the Colston trial. That's four young white uh, um, kids. I don't know I call them kids. It's slightly patronising. Four young yeah, young white people, um, and they saw it as their duty to remove a statue. Of a slave trade and i write articles about how horrible he was in the guardian uh but i didn't put a rope around his neck and pull him to earth they felt and it's fascinating talking to them they felt it was their moral duty uh and they, there was a, a very sophisticated understanding that they were in a better position to do that than young black people you know a certain understanding of the, that even though they were putting themselves in peril they were putting themselves in less peril than young black people um the fact that that statue that stood for 125 years was pulled pulled down by young white people, uh, again, there's a significance here. Okay, that gives me a, a beautiful segue to go to the next person I'm going to be speaking to. But just before I do, I think it's really important, especially, and I hope you'd appreciate this as, as a historian, of us as black people recording our own stories and recording our own history. And so, it was slightly um, remiss of me before I introduced you, um, David, is that the beautiful slides and the photographs that we saw just before we started are by the photographer that we saw 
right at the end of that little slideshow, um, Mr. Harriman, um, a black man who's done an amazing job in documenting um, the um, BLM marches and the and the last two years. And so, you know, it's important that we acknowledge and shout out to you know people who are documenting our future history. The um, your point with regards to um, uh, the role that different people from all different races can play in the anti-racism struggle gives me a beautiful segue, to, and thank you very much for that, David, to introduce um, Steve um, Slisher. Um, and so at this point, I'd like to bring Steve in, if it's um, possible, um, JK, to, to bring him full screen, I hope. Um, Steve is the lead or lawyer who delivered the prosecution's closing argument in the case that led to former police officer Derek Chauvin being convicted of um, George Floyd's murder. And I'm hoping I can see him now. Steve, welcome. First of all, um, so thank you so much for joining us. You're um, in Minnesota right now, is that correct? That's correct. And I'm absolutely honored to be asked to, to speak with you all today and, and share this uh, part of your organization's uh, origin story. So thank you very much for having me here. So first, my understanding is Derek Chauvin was sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison last year, a punishment that exceeds the state's minimum guidelines, but falls short of what you were requesting of a 30 year sentence. Can you tell us what the latest developments are? What is happening to the other police officers, for example, where you can. I know that there are um, some legal issues that means you might not be able to reveal too much, but I'd just be curious if you could bring us up to speed as to what's happening now. Sure, um, absolutely. And, and, in, and in fact, when I'm done speaking here, I'm on a brief pause today. Um, we're proceeding with the prosecution of the other officers and I'm in the middle of my trial preparations now, uh, but when I learned of your organization, I thought this was uh, important enough to, to pause uh, my activities for an hour and speak with you all. It, the, the sentence that uh, Derek Chauvin received, it was less than we asked for, more than the minimum um, under the guidelines. And just to highlight that, the, the standard sentence for this would have been 12 and a half years uh, for a, a second degree murder under these circumstances. But this was more. Uh, there was an additional 10 years that the judge imposed a little short of what we asked for, but I think significant for two reasons. First, uh, the death of George Floyd was not quick. It was slow, it was agonizing, and it was painful. As painful as it was uh, for all of us to watch, uh, you can't imagine what that must have been like to experience. I saw that part of your program, you are gonna be reflecting on the amount of time that he was held to the ground, uh, pressed down upon by these men. Uh, and I think that the sentence reflected that in part. And of course, there's no number of years that can atone for the taking of a human life, that can atone for the pain and misery that was inflicted on Mr. Floyd, on Mr. Floyd's family, and indeed the world. Um, but the other part of the sentence, I feel that, uh, was more than what uh, is normal in these circumstances is to reflect Derek Chauvin's position as a sworn police officer in my state, um, a public servant uh, and a public service is a public trust. And Derek Chauvin broke that trust and broke all of our hearts uh, in broad daylight in front of uh, a number of citizens who sat there in horror watching what was happening unfold right in front of them. And think of that because of the badge and the power of the badge and what he was empowered to do. Any other circumstance, you could imagine a group of uh, citizens seeing someone, one of their own being attacked, would be able to jump up and uh, intervene and, and pull the attackers off and, and render some kind of aid. But because of that badge, and, and what it means and what it represents. They were utterly powerless to do that, utterly powerless to do anything. And so uh, part of the additional sentence that Derek Chauvin received was for betraying his badge and betraying that public trust and subjecting these citizens, these horrified onlookers to something that they will live with for the rest of their lives as indeed all of us will. 
Uh, um, so go ahead. No, um, I, um, as far as the other officers, you know, they uh, they were tried in, in, in the United States. We have uh, we, we have our state court system, which I was participating in, in this time. We also have a federal system, which is a national sort of overlay. And all of the officers were prosecuted by our federal courts as well for deprivation of George Floyd's civil rights. Uh, Derek Chauvin pleaded guilty uh, to depriving George Floyd of, Floyd of his rights and uh, was, it will be sentenced to approximately 25 years. The other three officers went to trial federally. All of them were convicted in federal court for depriving George Floyd of his civil rights. And now we proceed with the rest of the state prosecution and that's what I'm preparing to do uh, at this time uh, for murder and for manslaughter. Right. Um, You've previously talked about the importance of diverse teams and, and inclusion, especially racially diverse teams in your, in your legal team, prosecuting um, Derek Chauvin. Can you explain why that's important to you and why that was important in the prosecution? Absolutely. I mean, some people uh, promote diverse teams as sort of a, of, a, of a right thing to do or a good or moral thing to do. And it certainly is. I would like to promote it uh, to people in business and in law as um, the smart thing to do. Because when you are a part of a diverse team, uh, you're surrounding yourself with people who don't necessarily look like you, think like you, or agree with you. And what it, what it creates is a much stronger end product. If, if I would have just assembled, or the Attorney General, uh, Keith Ellison is uh, African American, and if you had assembled a, a, just a group of your typical prosecutors, and most of them look, look a lot like me, you know, your 50-year-old white male, uh, contingent. We do. There tends to be a lot of cohesion because we don't disagree with each other. We, we, we tend to think the same way and see things the same way. And I think that if we would have had a, a, a group of people just like me um, creating this case and, and creating the narrative and driving what was important here, um, we would not have had the same result. Uh, because uh, we wouldn't have recognized and understood that uh, there were some parts of our case that we needed to emphasize more than others. There's experiences that we haven't had. Our team was so diverse in terms of gender and race and experience. And, uh, you know, it's not just enough to assemble the team, right? Diversity and inclusion, it has two parts, right? There's diversity and then there's the inclusion part. That's the part that people struggle with the most. Uh, many people will invite anyone to join them to agree with everything they say and never challenge any of their preconceived notions. I may be guilty of that a little bit myself. But when you have a diverse team, it means that there's going to be conflict. It means that people are going to see things uh, in different ways. That's not dysfunction. That is function. That is something that is going to result in something that is going to withstand scrutiny from so many different angles. That's what we had. And it was a special team. It was probably uh, one of the most unique and gifted uh, assemblies of people I've ever worked with in my life. Jerry Blackwell, uh, just a gifted, gifted trial attorney. Uh, uh, Neil Katyal, who, who uh, is of Indian descent, did all of our briefing and, and legal research just an amazing, amazing group of people. And as a result of our, our pushing each other and pulling each other and challenging each other, we were able to uh, put on a case that I believed at the end was unassailable. Now, people have described you as a quote unquote ally of the fight against racism. What is your view of, of that word? Yeah, you know, I, it's funny, I, I've heard the word before, I, I don't understand it completely. I try to, in my own, um, I guess my own conduct, I, I want to be a good friend. I want to be a good person. I want to be better than I was uh, the day before. I think that in order to be an ally, if, if that's what I am, I would, I, I certainly welcome that. Uh, and I hope I, I hope I live up to that. It, it is a matter of empathy. It's a matter of seeing people, seeing yourself in the face of other people. If I can't see myself, if I can't see my child, if I can't see my father in the face of George Floyd lying on the ground and being pressed upon by these officers, I don't have that empathy, then, then something is lost. And, and, and I think it's so important, you know, you hear um, people respond to different things. Uh, uh, for example, if someone was to say, Black Lives Matter, and, and a white person responds and says, well, 
um, all lives matter, which of course is undeniably true. Sure, all lives matter. Imagine though, if I were to tell you um, that my grandmother passed away, my grandmother was very special to me, my grandmother died. You responded to me and said, everybody's grandma dies. I might think that you don't care about me. I might think that you don't empathize with me. I, I might think that um, you really uh, just don't share any concern for me at all. And, and I think as, as white people, um, if we're trying to be an ally or just simply trying to be a, a decent and right person, we need to keep that perspective in, in mind. When the, the Black Lives Matter movement was born out of pain and death, and just trying to convey the notion that you can't be indifferent. Uh, you can't be indifferent to the harm that goes around, uh, along, uh, around uh, among, among you, right? And so to just simply dismiss it and say all lives matter um, is cold and it's indifferent. And you need to think about what you would feel like if you were trying to share that pain with someone and they were so dismissive. One thing that I'm curious about, because you talked about um, Derek Chauvin betraying the badge, um, do you view the prosecution of Derek Chauvin as being a prosecution against one bad cop or, you know, the one bad apple, um, one individual re bad racist cop, um, or is it a struggle against structural racism? You know, so yeah. how, how do you frame that? Yeah, it's so many things, uh, so many things. I view this with so many different lenses. I don't uh, uh, know what was in Derek Chauvin's heart and mind in terms of uh, whether I can say that he was a racist or not. I, I pose to you what is uh, more evil, hate or indifference? I don't know. Um, but if the result is the same, uh, I guess they're both just as bad. I think it was uh, a bad officer, certainly. It certainly was a failure of leadership, uh, certainly that. But the indifference and um, the implicit bias that took place that was the breeding ground for this to happen is undeniable. Um, the officers went into this area, uh, this particular part of Minneapolis with the attitude that the people who live here are criminals. This is gang territory. Um, and they respond to things, you know, they, they have a, an incredible amount of discretion. We give them that discretion because we want them to be able to protect us and protect ourselves. I can't imagine if that uh, I had passed a, a fake $20 bill at a gas station in my community that uh, the police would have pulled a gun on me so quickly within seconds of encountering me. I don't think they would have dragged me out of the car. I think they would have thought and assumed that it was a mistake that I had erroneously passed this along to someone. I certainly wouldn't have ended up handcuffed and I don't believe I would have ended up dead. People commit crimes, that is why we have police. People who do horrible things, horrible things, are taken into custody safely by police officers every single day in, 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 in the United States, in Minnesota, in Minneapolis. It happens all of the time. We had a young white male in uh, Wisconsin named Kyle Rittenhouse who had an AR-15 Assault rifle. Who you just got? Steve, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna have to cut you because we really have to meet. Oh, the, certainly. Um, one minute past past eight time because obviously that's a very special time. So I'd Absolutely. just like to to thank you, and Steve, thank you very much, um, David as well. Um, absolutely brilliant. So we'll now move on to the nine minutes and twenty nine seconds of silence to remember George Floyd and all victims of racism who have been and particularly those who've been killed in police custody. Nine minutes and 29 seconds, of course, is the time it took to murder a black man in broad daylight. Um, we're coming together as a community, even if it is online. So to feel part of the community where possible, I ask people to leave their cameras and their microphones on. There is a quality in, in the sound of silence. So that would be great. Um, where I am, it's just started raining, so you might even be able to hear tiny pitter patter rain on it. So if we could um, do that. Um, we are a few seconds away from one minute past past eight. I will we'll go for nine minutes, 29 seconds. And then after that, I'll bring everybody back. But hopefully we'll just have everybody on screen. Feel free to go through the screen, feel part of that. 
um, community. Mm -hmm. so. Just coming up to one minute past eight. Yeah. Okay, I'm now going to start the silence. Thank you, everybody. Starting now.
Thank you, everybody. Um, welcome back. Um, that was a long nine minutes and 29 seconds. I think it's, I, I did this last year and, uh, you know, I find that that time just seems to take an eternity and it's in, incredibly Telling, I think. As some of you might be aware, um, I held a silent online memorial for George Floyd last year. This year, I was approached um, by um, a group of friends, some people I didn't know, um, and some people that I absolutely love and respect, who told me that they were establishing something unique in the UK, a new Black-led organisation to tackle the structural racism that, that we face, which is endemic in UK society and continues to affect black communities. And they asked if they could partner with me this year. I didn't hesitate. I immediately said yes. Um, so let's play a short video. Hopefully um, the technical difficulties won't get in the way. Let's play a short video by way of introduction. I think we are. Um... Change. It's here. 
Brothers, sisters and friends, the time has come. The time, the time, has, time come. has come. The time has come. To build on protest and make lasting progress. Equality and justice are what we have our sights on. We have our sights on. We have our sights on. Introducing the Black Equity Organization, created to uplift and support our black British community in every industry and across all society. Working with allies and grassroots organizations, our aim is to dismantle systemic racism. If we work together, we'll get there sooner. We'll be the architects of our own lives. We'll not only survive, but thrive. Black mothers will no longer feel the pain of prejudice. They will bring forth new life into a world of fairness. The scales of justice will equalize with more Afro crowns judging trials. What a glorious future. What a glorious future. What a glorious future it will be. We strive ahead in action, in the pursuit of equality. Together, our vision is clear. Let's make the unjust just. Change is here. Hello and welcome back again. Um, before I introduce um, Vivian, who I think everyone can see, I'd like people to just to take the opportunity of, um, and while I introduce um, Dame Vivian um, Hunt, just to scroll through. Seriously, it, I, I find it really powerful. It's absolutely fine. Just, just scroll through, just look at all the people that are part of the community that have come together. Um, because when there were the BLM marches and protests, we took um, the solidarity, the sense of community, um, was nourishing and incredibly powerful. And even if we're not together physically, I think it's really important to, for us to be able to see each other. So while we're talking, just scroll through and see all the other people who have come together and decided to, to join um, us. So, you know, I'd, I'd really love it if people could do that. While you're doing that, I will now introduce, and it's gonna be a great pleasure to introduce the chair of um, the new Black Equity Organization, Dame Vivian Hunt. A woman with a long track record of championing racial justice on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, Dame Vivian has been named as one of the 10 most influential black people in Britain by the Powerless Foundation and one of the 30 most influential people in the city of London by the Financial Times. Welcome, um, Dame Vivian. Yesterday, you launched the Black Equality Organization I have so many questions, um, I'm sure we all do. So let's start with the most basic. What is the Black Equality Organization and what do you hope to achieve? Hello, Marcus, and thank you, um, you know, to all of our sisters and brothers and friends who've uh, joined for the vigil, as well as the um, uh, international launch of BEO. Um, BEO is a national independent civil rights organization. Our focus is on dismantling systemic racism, particularly as it disproportionately affects Black Britons. But as you, Steve and David mentioned right at the outset, you know, if there are systemic barriers and racism for anyone, you know, we want access to justice and equality for everyone. But we have to start where the evidence and our lived experience tells us there are gaps in delivering um, a world that has um, a less racism, particularly built into our institutions. And, you know, as Steve said so powerfully, those people and institutions who are supposed to serve the public and those who uh, depend on both public as well as private services. So in that sense, the mission and the call for change is very clear. It is simply an organization to be a national independent voice for Black Britons to help dismantle systemic racism and um, work with any organization, uh, grassroots organizations, partner organizations, 
um, local, national, and international who want to help us on that cause. So who is involved in the um, Black Equity Organization and how can all of us, myself included, how can we get involved? Well, our founding story is a simple one and it grew out of the same reaction and pain that you described um, after George Floyd's murder. In the days after that, David Lammy um, uh, convened a call with friends and uh, just really expressing the frustration and patience that all of us felt at a human level, the sadness, the a shock, um, the despair that not only were there a huge um, tragedy happening in that individual case, but it was just another sad but familiar um, anecdote. And the fear that we all have that it's just gonna be consigned to becoming another anonymous anecdote. But in that anonymity, combined with the simultaneous videoing, predominantly of young people, you know, held back by the legitimacy of the institution of the policing, but still with their cameras on, that it was able to be known to almost every person in Britain, Japan, Germany, South Africa, Nigeria, Brazil, um, St. Paul, Cleveland, simultaneously around the world, and to have people who were not in the black community, who didn't fear that it was their brother or son in the immediate sense, just see the injustice. And if you were a drone and didn't have Misson's talent uh, to be able to architect the narrative and story with a camera, but you were just looking at the telly the way I was in 2020 here in Britain, I just saw everybody on those streets, black people, white people, rich people, poor people, Bristol, Cardiff, Fife, you know, all over the country, people just reacting in a very human way um, with peaceful protest, but outrage uh, that these types of things are still happening. And so from that, David and others challenged our original founding trustees, myself, Karen Blackett, um, David, as I mentioned, Kwame Keomuma, Rick Lewis, to expand the group, uh, to pull in friends and allies, to put together an organization that could be a national response and voice. I was frustrated that the voices and profiles, well-meaning though they were, um, in the national media were not um, all evidence-based. They didn't really understand deeply the lived experience that Black British people were having. They minimized what young people were trying to do. And we just said, we know the quality and excellence that is in the Black community, and we can just do better than this. And so we started with a small group of Black British philanthropists, put together a little money to be able to think about what does excellent look like. We did a little research around the fact base that frankly proves, if you needed evidence, that um, Black Britons still suffer the disruptions of systemic racism um, severely. Um, others do as well, but our community does at a, a breadth and depth that is limiting to our progress. 95% of Black British students believe that racism is a barrier in their education. When you look at the cases of Child Q and Olivia, uh, recently profiled on this week, you can see the fear that you might have having your child even go to school. And so my uh, reaction is just to say, we wanted to do the work to really look at what do excellent civil rights organizations look like? What are their characteristics? And try and build an organization that was inclusive of grassroots organization, stood for Black Britain equity across all different parts of our community, but also was open to working with all of those allies who were out there on the streets in 2020, all of those corporations who put their hand up and said, I wanna do more, all of those who foundations who wanna activate grassroots organizations, and give them a channel through which they could begin to get that work done in a systemic way. And that's why our manifesto says, you know, turning from building on protest and ensuring that we make progress so that in 20 years, we are not sitting Zoom talking about another case of, you know, underskilled, overwhelmed, undertrained police you know, uh, committing a, uh, a, a violation of their own commitment and killing another member of the Black or any other community. So what can I do? I mean, it's, it's, it sounds, um, the organization that sounds amazing. 